I'm talking today about um, inscriptions of Rhodian priests, um, and I've called it cataloging of religious procedures, you can see um, on the slide. Over the last day and a bit, we've obviously, unsurprisingly, heard about lots of different kinds of lists um, that have survived in lots of different kinds of media. And I think, so one of the things that I've been thinking about is how much the choice of medium affects the reasons behind making lists um, and the functions that lists serve. Um, so be they aesthetic, practical, or historiographical. And inscribing lists of names specifically um, is clearly one of the sort of longest standing uses of writing there is. Uh, yesterday we heard about um, Sumerian king lists, um, uh, but we also still encounter lots of these. This, this habit hasn't died out. We encounter these kinds of uh, inscriptions of lists of names um, all over the place. I've picked out a few examples out of my own local context from various Oxford colleges and an Oxford school. Um, and, uh, and and so you can maybe see what the top one is, uh, is a sort of list of, of war dead. It's a memorial of John's College, which was part of a donors yeah. from Somerville College. And that one you I'll quite see, but it's a, a list of both the cricket captains from Magdalen College. <laughs> um, so these are slightly randomly picked, but there is a bit of a point to it. Um, one thing that, of course, unites all of them and that unites any is any type of inscription is that they're created as a physical object as much as a piece of writing, which means that they're created for a particular context and a particular audience. Um, and for that reason, these kinds of lists can take on a very local flavor and significance. For instance, the school list, um, and they often they often don't need much explanation because they're so deeply rooted in a specific cultural context, um, often a very specific community. So they're very much rooted in a space. The difference, just briefly saying with these with these three um, modern examples, uh, but between these types of nameless is their relationship to time. Um, what time period do listed names, listed individuals represent? In instances like war memorials or donor records, the people listed are tied to a particular event, a particular period um, of war or of a, of a sort of construction of a building, but they don't themselves mark out a chronology. Names are marked by chronologies like the cricket captains of um, Magdalen College School um, are, are sort of the, the kind of uh, the kind of evidence that I'm more concerned with today. And there, I think there's a further distinction, and that is where the lists are inscribed incrementally, so one by one, um, or all in one go, so as a sort of um, archival and historiographical effort. And the motives for both lists are, I think, uh, similar but still distinct. Um, and I sort of I think about it partly as this, the mentality of a uh, the sort of uh, confidence of inscribing just sort of one name at the top of a blank wall of steel or panel um, is sort of quite a different phenomenon from sort of sitting down and saying, okay, I'm archiving again. I know there's been like hundreds of whatever priests or cricket captains or something, and I can fill an entire wall with them. So these are just some of the as a as way of an introduction, my thoughts on some of the ways in which epigraphic lists are distinctive and, and sort of different from other lists, perhaps um, their relationship to time and to context, uh, to space and audience. And by looking at inscribed lists in a local context, we can tease out some of these factors and how they affect um, a culture of list making. By focusing on a particular locality or community, we can also take the exercise one step further and ask, how does an audience recognize a list as a list? What does making a list mean to a community? What other lists does it stand in relation to? And of course, uh, who is being inscribed and what do they mean? And in order to answer these kinds of questions, um, we ideally need a case study uh, of a place that sets up a lot of lists. And luckily, um, Ancient Roads uh, is just such a place. And the, the main point of the, the handout uh, that hopefully all of you brought, or at least can see, I didn't print like a huge amount, but hopefully there's, there's just a lot um, is actually just to give you uh, the, the, the sort of list of lists that have been inscribed um, catalogs that have been discovered and published um, from roads on the island um, uh, and from its sort of surrounding territories. And as you can see, if you sort of just glance at the at this uh, long list of lists on my handout, um, the catalogues all fall into the sort of general category of lists of officials, um, and even more specifically, religious officials. And I've tried uh, that the sort of way that I've organized them on my handout is 
um, in chronological order. So hopefully you can just sort of like access them more easily that way. And as you can see, if you look at the first and then the last one, um, the, the phenomenon of inscribing lists on roads um, spans sort of more than half a millennium. So the earliest one is the fourth century BC, and the last one is inscribed probably to the second century AD. So engraving priests was clearly not something the Rhodians tired of very easily. Um, and I just briefly want to can't really talk about priests of Rhodes without giving a shout out to the seminal book by Le Don de God, in which he uh, dated and did a huge amount of, of work on dating these different inscriptions. I to give you an idea of how important this work has been, you can see how much time I can't see, but this is like a scale of time and how much is covered by the names of different um, priests uh, over time has been a really sort of vital tool um, for uh, dating, um, <laughs> for, for dating Rhodian inscriptions um, and, and so for modern scholarship in general. Um, so I can say, you know, as, as modern scholars, we're very glad that the Rhodians inscribed so many lists, but um, why did they do it? And what did lists mean to Rhodians? If you look at the handout, the first two first two catalogues, um, Helios and the Priest of Athena Lindia, you can see both begin, if you look at the years covered, begin with a year within a year of one another in 407 and 402 respectively. This is really when priests begin um, to be inscribed. And so what was it that began this trend um, of inscribing lists? Yeah. Well, it's exactly in this year 407 BC that the three old cities, the islands of Cameron's and Lindos um, of the island of Rhodes, join together in what, uh, what's called a synoicism, which means that they unite into a single polis or a single state. As part of the political process, they furthermore decide to found a new city called Rhodes or Rhodos in the very northernmost tip of the island. We don't have a particularly straightforward account of exactly what happened during this process, but we can reconstruct the main facts. A new all Rhodian assembly and council were created uh, the three old cities became tribal subdivisions of the new state, um, and religiously, here we go, uh, the state was represented through the cult of Helios, uh, famously, um, and oops, my tetradrama has been to pop, cut off, uh, but in any case, it's, uh, that's, uh, the, the priests of Helios become the new eponyms of the state. That's sort of the main thing that matters for, um, for this talk. In order to understand the new Rhodian state and its social and religious culture, we also need to know that the old, uh, the three old cities, Yalisos and especially Camaros and Lindos, um, retained a fair amount of autonomy over their own affairs. They continue to exist as civic and religious centers um, for centuries. So they're a little bit like Nunes and Attica or something, um, but, but quite a bit bigger. And they even had their own eponymous priests after this synoicism. Um, so for Lindos, that's the priests of Athena Lindia. For Camaros, the Damiurgoi, the Yalisos, we are not entirely sure. So returning to these to these two first lists, the priests of Helios and Athena Lindia, both date back to the Synoicism, both list eponymous officials, and both are very similar in form. They give just names and patronymics. Um, why, why are they inscribed? Well, given that they're eponymous officials, they, they name the year. Um, one possibility is, of course, that they are practical. The public record keeping of eponymous officials of Rhodes um, might well provide a useful reference point. Um, again, each year's priest of Helios uh, was the means of dating decrees, and also um, uh, these uh, Amphora stamps uh, have the names of the priests on them. Um, and we might think, you know, that's sort of it's around the same time that um, the Athenians, for instance, decide to inscribe their archons, uh, and which is also coincides with the time when archon formulae are used to inscribe decrees. So maybe there's something going on. Uh, in that regard. And if we look at an image of the stele um, of the priests of Helios, uh, we can we can see that it's, it certainly could have served as a list to be consulted. Um, it's sort of quite a neat stele. It's uh, got the priests' names um, arranged in two neat columns. The heading states simply Halio Chiares Toide, the following our uh, priests of Helios. And the list of priests of Athena Lindia is, well, it's much more fragmentary as you can sort of get an impression of is one of the reasons it's needed so much scholarship um but also you can you can see that the lettering is is very clear and where we have slightly bigger fragments it's um it's, it's clear that the format is is also very uh very clear 
Given the political and constitutional developments of 407 BC, we can thus easily imagine the impetus for these lists um, uh, was, was to sort of, uh, as, as a practical measure, to inscribe these, these different eponyms. Um, it's briefly worth noting that, especially for pre superiors, uh, they weren't inscribed immediately in 407, as you can, uh, as you can see the inscription date is in 382 to 81, uh, and then the first of 27 priests are all inscribed in one uh, in one go. And this sort of goes back to what I was saying at the start, that just inscribing your own name is a little bit perhaps uh, hubristic. Um, on the other hand, the cult and priesthood that have existed successfully for 27 years um, were hopefully here to stay. And I think this shows that this sort of dating it back to the cynicism, to this new, to this beginning of this new state, also shows that there's a sense of historical consciousness in these catalogues. An explicit choice is made to inscribe the previous 27 priests, not just sort of start with yourself in 382, 381. Um, and we have, uh, there, there's sort of plenty of other parallels that show, uh, that show um, this sort of sense of historical consciousness can sometimes be quite explicitly spelled out. I've just given you, there's quite a famous example from Miletus, but I don't really have time to talk about it. The little town of Amazon in Caria um, has a very nice example of a list, which they very pointedly had. Um, the uh, those who became Stefan Neferoy, which is their eponymous officials, from the time when the Carians were freed, this follows two decades of rule by the Rhodians, in fact. Um, so again, the sort of sense of historical consciousness becoming quite clear um, in the in the um, catalogue from Amazon. Um, incidentally, they also wait about sort of a decade or so before they then retrospectively inscribe from the moment that they that something important happened to them. So the reason that I've spent so long on these first, I've got 14 lists I could talk about. I've spent quite a lot of time talking about Helios and Athena Lindia. And that's because, uh, in my opinion, they sort of kickstart uh, what, I, what I think of as the epigraphic habit of inscribing priestly lists on rows. It was the commemoration of annual priesthoods in these two prominent cults that set the trend for other sanctuaries to advertise their importance and, in fact, their rodianness in the same way. In the course of the 4th century BC, a catalogue of priestly names inscribed in similar form and format came to designate a distinctly Rhodian religious and civic prestige. And the striking thing here is that, with just one exception, none of these later catalogues list eponymous officials, which means we're clearly moving away from any sort of basic practicality argument. So I clearly don't have time to talk about all of these lists, so I'll just talk about a few uh, more examples. Um, Numbers three and four on my list, uh, the priests of Athena Polyas at Cameros, so I've just shown you where those are from, and the list of Poseidon Hippios from the um, surrounding area of Lindos were next up. They were described in the late fourth century. Both are again quite similar in form. We get relatively succinct headings. Um, and the, uh, the, the one from Cameros is perhaps extra interesting because it gives us, it, it sort of tells us the 10 priests. Um, I guess it's Karakos, Lucanos, uh, son of Lucanos, um, dedicates the list to Athena, and then we get the list of uh, priests of Athena. So again, we have sort of a decade or so retrospective, and then and then sort of continuing on year by year. And the the other thing I suppose about both of them again is just to stress that these are local for the new capital cities all the way in the north, and these are sort of local cults um, located in the in the territory of the old cities. Um, so I think uh, we, we can think here also about the potential appeal um, for holders of these, sorry, of these annual priesthoods, um, as well as a physical way of marking out a sanctuary sacred space. Um, and perhaps also just the sort of an attempt to raise the profile of these local cults. Um, so by the, by the end of the fourth century, this mode of epigraphic list making has developed firmly into a particularly Rhodian way of organizing and advertising one's cult. Um, and this all sort of happens, uh, it seems as well, in line with um, a change to annually rotating priesthoods, which also sort of works particularly well for this. Um, and we can see this sort of particularly clearly in the catalog of priests of the Sclepios from Tisanus, which is up there on the Carian Kersonesos. So this is a um, part of the region that becomes incorporated into the Rhodian state in the late 4th century BC, um, which means that the people who live there become 
Rodian citizens and the cults become Rodian cults. The catalogue um, from Hassanu's, uh, I haven't been able to find any good photographs of, is quite difficult to date, absolutely. So there's number five on your, and there's actually the one where there was a typo on Hannah, sorry. Um, correct it for anyone who's seeing it uh, in the chat. Um, was probably set up in the mid third century. And again, the sort of first probably 50 or so priests are inscribed in the same hand. So probably in one go. Um, which means that the first priest is dated to the late fourth century, which is the very period in which Pisanus becomes part of the Rhodian state. Um, and something similar probably happens on the island of Parker, who also sets up a very similar looking um, catalog of priests of Samothracian gods. Um, again, only once it becomes part of the Rhodian state. So in both these cases, priestly catalogues are set up after the community and its cults become officially integrated into the Rhodian state. In both cases, the general form taken is extremely similar to the other catalogues we've looked at. Sort of simple, straightforward title, names with patronymics, easily legible names arranged in columns. In the case of Thessanus, it's quite tempting to see a similar type of historical consciousness tracing the cult's official history back to the moment they join the Rhodian state. And I guess it's, it's possible that these, that these inscriptions um, were part of a manner of sort of top-down policy, you know, sort of saying, oh, everyone, every cult needs to inscribe their priests in this way. And I think it's plausible, definitely, that the prominence of annual priesthoods in all Rhodian territories is the result of something like that. Um, uh, but I think the actual inscriber, I think, I think the actual inscribed lists are far more likely on the initiative of the community or of certain individuals. Um, again, think about who is appealing for. It's appealing to the priests who are going to be inscribed. It's appealing to the cult of the sanctuary. Um, in the case of the catalogue from Pisanus, a priest, um, an individual, Archenax, son of Archenomos, who was a priest, stands out by putting his name at the very top of the stele, just as in the case of the Polyas priest from Kameros. So what I posit then is that setting up or attempting to set up a catalogue of annual priests becomes a way of displaying one's credentials as a serious Rhodian cult and an important statement of local identity within this greater state. The extent to which this habit, this uh, uh, epigraphic habit percolated is perhaps best seen in the final example that I want to just briefly talk about. Um, which is an inscription from a rural Lindian sanctuary and dated to the first century BC. Um, and this concerns, I'm going to put it in English, sorry. Uh, this concerns the priests of Zeus Patros, starting from when the Tragadetai decided to choose them yearly. And then we have two names, um, Xenocrates and uh, Lysistratus. So in this case, we're actually not in the civic sphere anymore. We're in a, the, the, the private sphere of a group calling itself the Tragadetai. The inscription explicitly refers to the association's decision to change their priesthood to an annual one, they decided to choose them yearly, which mirrors the most common priestly organization of the polis. Uh, the reform, or whatever under the cult, is perhaps a little bit short-lived. Only two names appear, and there's just a uh, blank space which is beneath it, you can sort of see in the picture. Um, managing to fill annual priesthoods is perhaps quite difficult. Perhaps they could have uh, learned from the example of even bigger cults, which, as we've seen, often waited a few decades to make sure there's actually a list worth setting up. Um, and perhaps they were a little bit, a little bit too ambitious. Uh, nonetheless, we can be grateful to the Tragadetai for giving it a shot and telling us the impetus, uh, the, the shift to annual priesthoods, um, the shift to the sort of proper Rhodian way in which they wanted to commemorate their priests. And, and just sort of briefly to my question, you know, what makes a list? Uh, usually, I think just having two names, we wouldn't call a list. But given the epigraphic cultural context that I've been talking about, I think it is fair, I mean, fair to the Tragadetai to say this is this is a priest list, you know, just, just a very short one. So to sum up, the phenomenon of inscribed catalogues of priests and other religious officials on roads provides an insight into the way a specific epigraphic habit could become established and developed in a region. Shortly after Sinoicism was political unification, the Rhodians, perhaps following some more general Greek trends in the period of setting up epigraphic monuments of, of eponyms, decide to display their new political and religious unity in the inscribed catalogue of the priests of Helios. The Lindians, who are always 
eager to emphasize their special cult and sanctuary of Athena follow suit. Um, and Cameros and the Alessandros might also have done at this point. The system of these multiple coexisting co eponyms um, perhaps explains why it's so immediately popular, um, this genre, um, and then perhaps also why it's adapted so quickly by other cults. The fact that newly incorporated territories and eventually even a sub civic group worshipping at a royal shrine somewhere were <laughs> shows the increasing popularity of this epigraphic genre. By adopting this, this list format, worshipping groups could hope to amplify the status of sanctuary and priests. So the answer to why did the Rodians inscribe so many priests lists might simply be that after initial display of unification in this particular manner, um, the trend grew and became a habit. Another way perhaps to answer this question to think about it is to point out what these lists are definitely not concerned with doing. None of them attempts to or claims to trace a cult's history back any earlier than the synoises in the late fifth century. And that's, you know, that is something we find in other priest lists, and a famous example uh, uh, priest, uh, priest list of, uh, sorry, priest of Poseidon, who are inscribed by the Halicarnassians um, around the turn of the first century BC. Um, and the Halicarnassians trace this priest back to the hero Telamon. So this is definitely something one could, one could try to do. And I haven't really had time to talk about the end of this of this habit on roads. Uh, if you look at the final catalogue numbers on the list, you can see that um, these are the other uh, the other local eponyms, the Damiorigoi. Um, and this is the only truly sort of archival example of lists from roads. Uh, the eponymous Damiorigoi are uh, inscribed at some point in the imperial period, um, uh, reaching back to at least the early third century BC. Um, but even in this list, they're not used to trace like really ancient, ancient history, which we might expect them to do. This was just not what Rodian priestly catalogues meant or stood for. Um, and instead, just to sort of show you what, you know, that, uh, another type of list can perhaps be, be used for, for that kind of purpose. Within just a few years of this Caliphnassian catalog that proclaims the antiquity of their Poseidon cult, the Lindians found their own way to show their sanctuary's great age and fame through the inscription um, of the so-called Lindian Chronicle in 99 BC, which is a long list um, of the motives that are left in the sanctuary throughout time, um, beginning with their eponymous hero, Lindos, the grandson of Helios. So this is the kind of thing where they're really going, going all the way back um, in time. Um, and the fact that this, this happened around the same time as the Halicarnassus list um, shows us this sort of cultural context of the early first century BC, when these claims of religious antiquity have become cultural currency. In the early fourth century BC, on the other hand, the Lindians had other matters on their mind. The basic form of these early Rodian catalogues, consisting of just names and patronymics and neat columns, on the most fundamental level was simply that, a list of names. Their inscription in these sanctuaries was a way of defining the religious community and its place within Rodian religion. Over time, we then see how the existence of this epigraphic habit becomes an enticement in its own right. The very Rodianness of inscribing annual priests becomes something to emulate and something that might give one's cult religious credibility. Thank you very much.